Well, good morning. It's good to see all of you. And uh, I wasn't sure, can you guys hear me? I wasn't sure if I was going to get booed <laughs> um, based on things that happened earlier in the week. No <laughs> I was like, how will I explain that if I get booed? But anyway, it's an honor to be here with you all today. My name's Daniel Bennett, and I, I've been part of CARES for about 15 years. I came about 15, 16 years ago as a student and, uh, and have loved it. I came out here in my 20s, and now I'm in my 40s. And, uh, and now I've got a wife and children, and, and I'm loving life. It's just awesome to be part of this ministry. Love seeing all the lives changing. And, uh, you know, as the student body knows, I, I love sharing about my children. You know, I have a, my, my wife is home with my kids right now. I've got three children, Olivia, Joshua, and James, and they're probably watching right now. And so I wanted to start off with one quick little story before I kick things off. So Pastor Greg tells funnies. I either tell torture stories or children's stories. It's kind of... <laughs> Kind of where I've landed. And so uh, the other day I was changing clothes in my closet and my boy loves to just chase me around the house and follow me wherever I go. And, and so I, I love that. And so I was, I was about to change clothes and my boy's like, can I sit on that? And he points to the top shelf in the closet. And I was like, no. And he says, can, can I sit on that? And he points to the next shelf and I say, no. And he says, can I sit on that? And he points at my shirts on hangers. I'm like, no. And he points at the hamper. Can I sit on that? And I'm like, no. And then he points at the door and says, can I sit right here? And I say, you want to sit on the door? And uh, then I look down and I see this. Could you all show the photo? <laughs> so, and so I, I consider myself a creative problem solver. And so this is a, a proud moment for me. <laughs> I was like, that was, that's amazing. I was not expecting that. So you guys can take that down. <laughs> anyway. Now, before I get started with my message today, um, I also would like to mention one quick thing. My, my youngest, my one-year-old, um, he just, a, a couple, like a week or so ago, started taking his first steps. And I finally got to see him take a couple of his first steps um, a couple days ago. And all you parents know this, I just want to share something obvious but good. So I just want to share something real quick on a father's heart, is that my little boy, when he takes a couple steps and falls over, that is the highlight of my month, right? I don't look at him and say, but you fell, right. right? A father's heart rejoices at, oh my goodness, you want to be like me. Oh my goodness, you took two steps and you fell. Some of you may be beating yourselves up because you're like, I keep trying to get up and I fall down and God must be so disappointed in me. That's not what a father's heart is like. A father's heart rejoices that a righteous man can fall seven times and get back up. God, God is for us. He celebrates our victories. He doesn't, he doesn't dwell on our failures, our mistakes. And so, um, speaking of my children, one thing that, that uh, sparked this message um, is that, you know, a few months ago, I was thinking, I was telling, I don't know if you guys ever do this, um, if you ever, you know, kind of like that whole, like, if we won the lottery kind of thing, um, not that we're preaching pro lottery or anything, you know, but once I was telling my wife, I was like, you know, if money were no object, I think I'd want to do this and that and the other for our kids. And when I said that, something just hit me. And I, and I got angry about it. And I was like, wait a minute. I realized I was angry because I was like, I've been believing a lie. Because I was like, the fact that I just said if money were no object, I'd do this wonderful thing for my kids. I was like, because I, I used to think I have no problem with abundance. But it suddenly dawned on me that lack is straight up ungodly. There were good, godly things I wanted to do for my children, and I couldn't because I didn't have abundance in that area. And it just made me angry because I was like, I've always thought that it's not a big deal. It's okay. I'm not against it. And then, you know, you grow out of it, and you're like, okay, I'm for it. But then it's like, no, no, it's not just that you should be for it. It's that this is what God wants for us. It is ungodly not to walk in abundance. And so what my topic for you today is, is breaking a poverty mindset. And so it actually is very similar. It builds on what Pastor Rick was just sharing and even what Pastor Greg was sharing earlier today. You know, I, I've been a believer since before I can even remember, right? My first memories are, are my first, one of my first memories is getting born again as a child. And so I, I've lived life with God my whole life and yet he's never gotten stale. He still manages to surprise me, right? See, the kingdom of God is not information that you can just learn it and be done with it, right? I like to think of it like the Bible. I don't just see words on a page. It's like a menu, it's, I don't want to just memorize the menu. I want to eat the food in the menu. 
right? It's like a travel brochure. Some people study and memorize everything they can about scripture. And it's like, but have, have you actually gone there? Have you actually gone to the kingdom of God or are you just learning about it from a distance? I love to actually live it, to experience it. I want to, to experience these things. And when you actually eat the menu, not eat the menu, eat the food in the menu. <laughs> you can try that. <laughs> It'll be memorable. But when you actually start experiencing the things in the word, you realize this will never run out. So absolutely never run out. And so before I get started, I also want to mention when I talk about breaking poverty mindset, I'm not talking about money. I'm talking about money and every other form of, po of poverty and prosperity. So if you hate, if you love getting offended at prosperity messages, you're going to love this message. <laughs> I'll give you a lot to work with. So... Um, let me see here real quick. Yeah, prosperity and, and abundance and poverty mindset is a very interesting topic to me because if you'd asked me 25 years ago, I would have told you I don't have a poverty mindset, right? But then if you'd asked me 20 years ago, I would have said like, oh yeah, I had one, but God set me free from that. But then if you'd asked me 10 years ago, I would have been like, well, yeah, I thought I was before, but now I really am. If you'd asked me five years ago, I would have said, now I really, really, really am. I thought I was, but now I really, really, really am. And then it became yearly. Almost every single year, I'd have this major breakthrough. I'm like, oh my goodness, I just broke out of a poverty mindset in an area I had no clue. It became yearly, then it became every six months. Right now, it's about every three months. Every three to four months where I'm like, I, I just feel like I, I'm a totally new person. I've just broken free from things I never expected. And it's not that I was wrong each time. See, the thing about breaking out of a poverty mindset is that you're not just breaking out of something, it's that you're breaking into an abundance mindset. See, if we focus on poverty, that's a problem. Poverty is a problem, and you can solve a problem. When you solve a problem, it's done. But abundance is not a problem you can solve. Abundance is infinite. So if you're breaking from a poverty mindset and you only think about lack, then eventually you can solve that problem. But if you focus on abundance, you'll never run out. It's infinite. And, and the thing about an abundance mindset is that the moment you break into a new level, where you just were looks like poverty. Compared to where I am right now, how I thought six months ago looks like poverty. Compared to where I am right now, the way I thought yesterday looks like poverty. Because if we're constantly growing into more and more and more, we look back and we say, man, I was missing out and didn't even realize it. That was good. I loved life right then, but I can't even imagine going back to that. Right? And back to like my kids, right? My wife and I are like, we can't even remember life before we had kids. We love it so much that we, like, we didn't even know what we were missing out on. We, we're so thrilled with our life today, right? And you hear grandparents say, like, you think that's good. Wait till you have grandkids. And your great-grandparents say, you think that's good. Wait till you have great-grandkids. And then imagine Adam and Eve. Uh, you think that's good. Wait till you have great, 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 great. <laughs> so anyway, it always becomes a contest with grandparents. That's what that's, yeah, I've noticed. So it's not just breaking from a poverty mindset. It's breaking into an abundance mindset. It's not something we're supposed to solve. You know, the main scripture I want to look at today is John 10, 10, and most of us know this verse by heart, right? The thief does not come except to steal and to kill and to destroy. I have come that they may have life and that they may have it more abundantly. You know, abundant doesn't just mean a lot of enough. Abundant means excessive, over and above, more than necessary. And if you think about that, why would you need more than necessary life? Right? Isn't enough life enough, right? I mean, enough life is still eternal, because if it's not eternal, then it's not enough. But God's saying, I don't want you just to have enough life. I want you to have more than you need. I want it to be excessive. Excessive, above and beyond life. Why would he want us to have more than we need? And so, that's what I want to be talking about today, is, is how and why to break out a poverty mindset, or another way to call this, is how and why to break into an abundance mindset. But before we get started, again, I'm giving a lot of intros. Um, it's like a five-act play. I don't know. <laughs> it's, okay, we're still working on it. Okay, so first of all, I want to tell you how to be prosperous in 20 seconds. Now, it's not going to take me 20 seconds to tell you. It'll take me 10 seconds to tell you and 10 seconds for you to do it if you choose to do this. All right, so first of all, are you ready? This really works. I'm not kidding. So think of everything that you have, everything that you own. Think of all your money, all your resources, everything you have access to. That's step one. Step two, dream smaller than that. If you do that, and I hope you didn't, <laughs> if you do that, you now have more than enough. Congratulations, you're prosperous. Right? That's ridiculous, but it's true. 
And my point in this, again, I don't hope you actually do that, but it works. If you dream smaller than what you have today, you're prosperous because you have more than enough, right? All you have to do, and my point in this is that you control your definition of enough. We all control what we think enough is. And that's actually the root of most poverty thinking is that we don't realize we're broke and poor in an area of our lives because we have the wrong definition of what enough is. See, it can hide beneath the surface. If you have the wrong definition of enough, you're gonna have the wrong definition of more than enough because you don't even know what, you're, what you should be aiming for, right? If the poverty's in your vision, then you'll be broke in many, many areas of your life and not even realize it because you think you have enough. See, if we don't know who God created us to be and we don't know that we're like, he's created us to be like Jesus and, and we're just looking at our peers, saying like, well, compared to them, I have enough. Compared to them, I have enough. Compared to them, I have more than enough. I'm, I'm, there are so many people who think they're prosperous and successful because they have the wrong definition of enough when actually they're broke and poor and, and destitute. They just don't even realize it. See, poverty mindset can hide beneath the surface. It can hide in our vision, in our dreams, in our hopes, in our expectations, right? Maybe poverty isn't in one obvious area, but maybe it's in our expectations. Maybe the poverty is in what we think our potential is. Where it's like, oh no, God, you know, God couldn't use me at that level. He could use me at this level, but not that level. And we don't realize, no, that's changing your definition of enough, which means that you don't even realize you're missing out. It can be poverty in how we think God could use us. We say, I just don't think God could do that, right? So some, some ways are obvious. A few examples here. The obvious poverty mindset type things, right? Is if you say things like, I could never afford that. That's an obvious one, right? Or maybe I'll always get the cheapest version of everything, even if it'll break right away. Right, just a poverty mindset on the surface. Or maybe even a poverty mindset could say, I have to hoard everything because I'm afraid of going without. So you just never let go of things and hang on to garbage way too long. Or another version of an obvious poverty mindset is I'll never take any risks because what if I fail? <laughs> not realizing that by not taking risks, you failed. Right? But there's more subtle forms of a poverty mindset. Right? And usually it starts with the phrases, I don't think I could ever do that. Or I don't think God could ever do that, right? Where it's much more subtle because we say, I, I don't think that's for me, right? I don't think God could ever heal me of this pain, so I'm not going to even ask for that. I'm just going to ask for this one over here, right? You can see this, right? We start negotiating with God. I'm not even praying for full healing. I'm just praying for the pain to go from a 10 to a 7, thinking that that blesses God when it's completely missing God's heart. Of, like, that's actually creating a barrier because you're saying, I don't even know who you are, Lord, but I'm trying to receive healing, right? Or saying things like, I don't think I could ever be as talented as that person. I don't think I could ever forgive that person, right? These are poverty mindset that are a bit more subtle because they hide beneath the surface. It can even be more subtle if we spiritualize it, right? Christians are really good at this. Find a Christian, a Christianese way to embrace and celebrate the fact that you're believing a lie, right? So, some people embrace poverty and just use the excuse of, I'm just being content. This is a godly thing. I'm just being content. I'm not like all you greedy people. I'm just being content. Right? I'm just being humble. I don't, need to, I don't need to pursue being effective in the kingdom. I'm just being humble. Um, you know, or people say things like, if God wants me to have more, he'll make it happen. You know, just kind of like, nope, nope, nope. You know, and not realizing, no, you're totally broke in your vision and you're blaming God. Right? Maybe to say, I don't just have that gift. What did Paul say about the gifts? Desire the best ones. He didn't say, well, ask your pastor which one he thinks you might be good enough for. And, you know, pursue the worst ones. Pursue the, read, read the list of gifts of the Spirit. Which one do you think is lame? That's probably yours. I right? know Paul says, go after the best ones. Which one makes your baby leap, as Pastor Greg says, right? Which one, when you see the list of gifts, you're like, I hope I get that one. Paul said, pursue, earnestly desire the best gifts. Right? So he didn't say, be falsely humble about this. Right? Or maybe people just say, that's just not how God wants to use me. And they, they're spiritualizing it. And so what you're doing is, is burying it. Right? You're hiding it beneath the surface that there's a poverty mindset. We don't realize it because we start deceiving ourselves. So my first point in all this and how to break free from a poverty mindset is that we need to expand our definition of abundance. See, money is a resource and it's a great resource. It's a tool. But there's all kinds of resources. If we could pull up slide number one, please. And this isn't even a complete list. I had to trim it down just so it fit on the screen. These are all different types of resources, right? Money, vision, uh, time is a resource. Health is a resource. Energy, 
right? If you don't think energy is a resource, try doing something without it. I only got three and a half hours of sleep last night because my kids woke up and <laughs> energy is a resource, right? Athleticism, ability, talent, intelligence, there's so many. I won't read the whole list here, right? Um, trustworthiness is a resource. See, there's so many resources that, aren't, resources that aren't obvious. If you don't think trust is a resource, try accomplishing something when nobody trusts you. You can do more things if people trust you than you can if no one trusts you. Courage is a resource. Humility is a resource. Excellence is a resource. These are all areas where we can either have lack or have enough or have abundance. Right? And see, so many times people think abundance and they just think money, relationships, and that's it. Money and health and relationships. There's so many types of, re of resources, and God wants us to have abundance in all of them. He doesn't want us to have lack in, in you know, eight different sections of our life and only have abundance in one section. So if it's, it's actually more of a spectrum, too. If we could go to slide number two. Right? So there's a whole spectrum there. And if you could go, actually go ahead and go to slide number three. See, it's not just lack and enough. You can actually have crisis lack, which is trying to kill, steal, and destroy your life. Or you can have more than enough. See, if you think big and you have enough, you still just have a lot of enough. God's best for us is actually for us to have even more than our thinking big. He wants us to have more than enough, abundance. Like I said, we control our definition of enough. And we really want God to control our definition of enough. We want to renew our minds to change our expectations. So with, with any of those resources I just listed and many more, you can have crisis lack or just a little lack or barely enough, a lot of enough, or more than enough. With every single one of these, write a few examples. Imagine you have lots of money, but no time. See, you might say, oh, I did, you know, I'm so wealthy. What if you had $100 billion and two minutes to live and no lawyer nearby so that you can't even give them a will, right? You can't do anything with it. See, a lot of abundance in one, one area, but crisis lack in another area means you're poor. To have truly abundant life, it can't just be abundance in one area. It needs to be abundance in all the areas, right? What if you had all the time in the world but no health, right? What if you had amazing vision, but no work ethic? What if you had amazing intelligence, but no wisdom? What if you're brilliant, but nobody trusts you? You haven't built relationship with anybody, and so you're always a know-it-all telling people what they should do, and you haven't earned relationship with anybody, right? What if you have amazing athleticism, but you have no patience, Right? Amazing world-class athletes have amazing patience. They have to train early, or early in the morning, late at night, hours and hours and hours doing the exact same thing over and over and over. And people only watch them when the lights are turned on. But, right? but the excellence came from that patience of, I'm just going to train and train and train when nobody's watching. Right? So again, you can have amazing athleticism, but if you don't have patience, you won't rise to your full potential. So if we have, a, if we have lack in some areas, they can drag us down. God doesn't want us to have lack in any of these areas. And so, you know, the best resource is actually, and I left them off the list because um, you could go on and on with this, right? But the best resources are the fruit of the Spirit, right? Love, joy, peace, kind of self-control is powerful. Thankfulness is a powerful resource. There's things that if you don't have enough thankfulness in your heart, God can't use you in certain ways. But if you have an abundance of thankfulness, there's things God can do in your life that he could never do otherwise, right? Revelation. It's one of the most powerful resources. It's having a transformed mind, a renewed life, a changed life. Grace, right now, so with some of these, right, grace, righteousness, we already have abundance. It's just a matter of are we aware of it? Are we walking in this? Right, righteousness we, um, is, some, is a resource. And to me, in my opinion, the most powerful resource in the world is a word from God. Right? I mean, even just recently, right, banks are failing, right? A word from God is more powerful than currency, right? If you have a word from God, it's like, this, I can take this to the bank. Better than take it to the bank, <laughs> right? It's like, no, banks can fail. The word of God will not fail. And so the best, re right, if you want abundance, pick the best ones first and use those to raise up the other ones. So um, slide number four, please. Just a few more examples here. All right, so with uh, just a few examples, with enough of a resource, you'll get the job done. Lack of a resource makes life more difficult. Crisis lack of a resource will drag down other areas, right? So for example, enough money will get the job done. A lack of money will make life more difficult. And a crisis lack of money will try to kill, steal, and destroy your life. 
Enough patience will get the job done. Lack of patience makes life more difficult. A crisis lack of patience will try to kill, steal, and destroy your life. Right? Enough humility will get the job done. A lack of humility will make life more difficult. And a crisis lack of humility will try to kill, steal, and destroy your life. And you could go on and on and on. Right? So, like I said, the first way to break out of a poverty mindset is that we need to expand our definition of abundance. It's not just money. It's not just health. It's, it's both of those and more and more and more and more. Um, you know, it isn't true abundance if we have lack in other areas. If we have the wrong definition of enough, in, of enough in other areas, it'll mess things up, right? So people might say, you know, I have enough humility. What I really need is just more abundance, or sorry, uh, more abundance of influence. I've got enough humility, just give me the influence already. And they don't realize, like, no, your definitions are off, right? Or people can easily say, like, no, no, I've got enough wisdom. What I really need is just more money. Or, you know what, I've got enough peace. I just need everyone else to stop being idiots, <laughs> it's not me, it's them. Like, I don't know, just drive, just drive normal, my goodness, <laughs> right? And so we don't realize, like, oh, no. So, again, we, we see lack in others, and we don't realize, like, no, our definition's off. We could grow in this, right? One way to know if we see something truly as a resource is do you daydream about what you do with lots of it, right? See, it's easy to say, if I had a billion dollars, this is what I'd do. But how many people say, if I had all the wisdom in the world, this is what I'd do? If I had all the kindness in the world, this is what I'd do. Man, I hope someday I'm so humble I could do this, right? Do we fantasize about like, man, I wish, because if we don't dream, right, like Pastor Rick was just sharing, if we don't have hope, if we don't have dreams of what it would be like to be stronger, to be more Christ-like, man, if only I were more patient, I would love to do this. If only I had more talent or vision or, or you know, work ethic, I could accomplish these things. It shows that we're truly thinking about it as a resource that we want to grow in. And by the way, in some contexts, when I say more, right, more than enough, abundance, we're not talking about more quantity. Sometimes we're talking about more quality. So, for, for example, you don't want an abundance of marriages. <laughs> you want abundance in your marriage, right? And so, same thing, right? With, with some things, it's actually a balance where it's like abundance of friendship for a while might mean more and more friends. But after a while, it's like, actually, I don't want more friends. I want better friends or better friendships. For some of you, Losing a few friends would actually be a form of abundance, <laughs> or at least a few steps toward abundance, again, because it's about the qualities increasing. And so, let me see here. So first point is we need to expand our definition of abundance. The next one is that we need to stop being afraid of abundance and stop judging it. Right? Abundance is not selfish. Abundance won't corrupt you. See, some people think, think deep down inside that it's wrong to have abundance or it's wrong to want abundance. And so they don't embrace it. And, so, and then they sit back and just judge people or make up excuses or, you know, sure that they have more abundance than me, but they must have something off in their life. They must be greedy. They must not love God as much as I do. They're not as holy as I, right? And people can sit back and judge. And if that's our heart, we're fighting off a blessing from God. We're believing a lie. See, when we expand our definition of resources, or of abundance, sorry, we realize that we're not competing for limited resources. And that's one of the big lies is people think there's a finite amount of resources and we're all fighting for it. And you know what? I'm just going to step back and not fight for it. And I'm just going to be super humble and let other people enjoy grabbing all these things. But see, a poverty mindset gets jealous. An abundance mindset celebrates when it sees abundance in others. Other people's abundance doesn't take away from me at all. Other people's abundance, if anything, it blesses me. See, it makes no sense to say, because you have more, I have less. And yet people in the world say this all the time. And again, I won't get uh, too much in the, you know, people have believe all kinds of lies about money and think, well, if you have more money, I'll get to money in a second. Give me a second. <laughs> Can we go to slide number five real quick? So for example, it makes no sense to say, you have too much time, save some time for the rest of us. <laughs> it makes no sense, right? You having more time does not affect me at all. It doesn't make sense to say, you have too much health. Save some health for the rest of us. You and your greed for health. Look at you. You proud of yourself? You proud of it? You're so healthy and look at all the sick people. Right? Just save some for the rest. How dare you be so gluttonous for health? Right? Now, people do say this about energy, right? You have too much energy. Save some for the rest of us. But usually they're joking. <laughs> But again, it makes no sense to say you have way too much energy, save some energy for the rest of us. It makes no sense to say you have too much creativity, save some creativity for the rest of us. Although I do say that to the murans sometimes. 
what, what on earth? Come on, guys. <laughs> Where was I when God was handing out that talent? Okay. <laughs> so, right? It makes no sense to say, you have too much work ethic, save some work ethic for me. Right? It makes no sense. See, a poverty mindset looks at others who are successful and in abundance and says, how dare you? It makes no sense. It's a lie. And if we think that way about others, what we're doing is just pushing ourselves away from it. When in reality, it's no, we should celebrate when we see success in other people. See, yeah, I'll, I'll use money as an example here real quick, right? With money, people say like, how dare you have more money now there's less for us. But see, money isn't actually a thing. Money just represents value that somebody created. So even with this example, it makes no sense to say, you've created too much value. Save some value creation for the rest of us. That makes no sense. But, but people have heard the lie about money so much that people think that about money, that if you have more, then you're evil. It's a tool. So abundance is amazing even when it's in somebody else. See, the world is a better place because of, of abundance that people before us and people around right now have experienced. Right? I love enjoying songs that I didn't write. That's somebody else's abundance blessing me. Their abundance of creativity, their abundance, right? I, I love that now we can enjoy worship songs that don't have terrible doctrine. I don't know about you guys, but I grew up in a world where if you want a good song, you have to compromise what you believe. And if you, <laughs> and if you want good lyrics, you gotta make them up yourself, right? But, so, but see, now people's abundance of relationship with God and their musical expertise and their creativity and their joy, I benefit from that. And I haven't written a single one. Right, see, I love eating food that I didn't create, that I didn't, that I didn't cook. It's like, this is amazing. Somebody else's joy and creativity and passion poured into that, and I get to eat it. After microwaving it for 60 seconds. <laughs> I'm just joking. Okay, but I love using technology that I didn't invent. Right, imagine if we lived in a world where you could only use things that you invented from scratch. I would much rather benefit from the abundance of others. Right? I love laughing at jokes I didn't come up with. Right? I love using buildings I didn't build. Right? I didn't have to physically build my house and I get to live in it. Somebody else's abundance and creativity and work ethic. Right? I love, I love gaining wisdom I didn't have to figure out on my own. Right? See, other people's abundance can bless us if we celebrate it instead of saying, like, how dare you think you're better than me. It's like, no, I love seeing other people thrive. We should all want to thrive. It makes the world a better place. You know, I love watching world-class athletes compete. Their athleticism does not make me less athletic. It doesn't hurt me at all. Worst case scenario, I don't care about their sport. But maybe I do enjoy their sport and it provides entertainment for me. And maybe it actually inspires me to work out. So if anything, their abundance might actually help me become more athletic. See, other people's abundance can actually inspire us and help us grow instead of taking away. And we gotta get away from the lie that someone else succeeding is, is detracting from me. Amen. So, it's a lie to think I'll be more selfless and not want abundance. I'm, I'm gonna leave more for everybody else because see, the thing is, we're not created to just suck up abundance from others. We're created to overflow with abundance. Right, some people think there's too many people in the world. There's not enough resources for everybody. That's ridiculous, because humans are creators of resources. Humans are creators of value, right? It's just a lie in the world that it's all, we're, we're all just competing for a piece of the pie and we just need fewer people around, <laughs> right? See, some people think, like I said, I'm just content, I don't care about abundance. And that is incredibly selfish, it's incredibly small thinking, right? And they'll use 1 Timothy 6, 6, which is a great verse, but it can be misused. 1 Timothy 6, verse 6. Now godliness with contentment is great gain. But they miss the word godliness. Godliness with contentment, not lies with contentment. Not ungodliness with contentment, right? And if you look at 2 Corinthians 9, 8, same author, the Holy Spirit and Paul. So 2 Corinthians 9, verse 8, uses the same word for contentment. Here it's translated sufficiency. So it says, and God is able to make all grace abound toward you, that you always having all sufficiency, same word as contentment in the previous verse, and all things may have an abundance for every good work. See, godly contentment is tied to abundance because you can't be content without enough to overflow. We're content in who we are in Christ and who we are in Christ is more than enough. Right, 3 John 1 verse 2. 3 John 1 2 says, Beloved, I pray that you prosper in all things and be in health just as your soul prospers. See, God wants us to prosper in every single thing. Another point, in, um, sub point in here is that abundance doesn't corrupt us. 
See, some people think, the, the people will say things like, you know, power corrupts, absolute power corrupts absolutely, right? I'm sure you've heard that phrase, or many of you have. Or people say things like, money changed them. Ever since they got more money, it just changed them. Things like that. But the thing is, God is all-powerful. Did it corrupt him? All right, God is rich. He's really, really rich. Did it corrupt him? Absolutely not, right? So, so power and wealth aren't the problem. See, money doesn't change you, it multiplies you. It multiplies who you already were. See, if, let me give an example. If you're evil and broke, you can do some harm. If you're evil and wealthy, you can do even more harm. If you're evil and wealthy and strategic, you can harm countless people. But is the abundance of wealth the problem? Is the abundance of strategic thinking the problem? No, those multiplied the evil. But see, look at it the other way around. See, don't blame the abundance. See, abundance of wealth isn't the problem. If you're generous and broke, you can bless some people. But if you're generous and wealthy, you can bless even more people. If you're generous and wealthy and strategic, you can bless countless people. See, abundance is not the problem. It's multiplying us. So the real question isn't, the real question isn't, is abundance good or bad? The real question is, are you worth multiplying? Right? Is it a good thing or a bad thing to multiply me? If you're born again, you're a new creation. You're righteous, you're holy, you're kind, you're generous, you're full of humility, you're full of boldness, you have the mind of Christ, and you have God's desires in your heart. The best thing you can do for the world around you, the most selfless thing you can do for the world around you is be multiplied. All right? It's incredibly powerful. Right, another example, right? If you're creative, you can have great ideas. If you're creative and you have work ethic, you can actually do something with them. If, you have, if you're creative and you have work ethic and you have courage, right, you can create things that no one else would have ever created. You can change the world. And so again, abundance is, is a huge blessing to the people around us. 1 Timothy 3.6. Right, see, one quick little warning here is that if you're carnal and immature, then yes, you do want to be careful. Right? 1 Timothy 3.6 says, uh, when Paul's talking about the qualifications to be a bishop, he says, not a novice, lest being puffed up with pride, he fall into the same condemnation as the devil. So he's saying, he's not saying promotion to be a bishop is a bad thing. He's saying, don't want that if you're still, if you're still struggling with humility and character, things like that. Right? If you have a lack of character and a lack of humility, influence could harm you. But if you have an abundance of character and an abundance of humility then influence is, is incredibly effective, right? And so we want to be careful. We don't want certain abundances to outpace others because it could be harmful to us. But we want abundance in every area. The abundance was never a bad thing. It's always a good thing. So uh, the first point, like I said, is we need to expand our definition of abundance. The second point was that we need to stop being afraid of it. We need to stop judging it because we're, we're, we're removing ourselves from that grace. And the third one is that we need to understand the point of abundance. Like I said at the very beginning, why does God want us, why did Jesus say he wants us to have more life than we need, right? Why didn't he just say, I want you to have enough life? Come to me and I'll give you enough. The thief wants to take it, I want to give you barely enough. Why did he say, I want to give you more than you need, more than you could even use? And like I said, we control our definition of enough. So I'm not even talking about, right, dreaming really, really, really big and getting just enough. He's saying, no, no, more than enough regardless of how big you're dreaming. So, three reasons I want to touch on. One reason why it's powerful to have more than enough is giving. Right, that's powerful, and I could talk about that for, for hours. We could all talk about that for hours. We, you know, generosity is amazing. It's not something that we do. It's part of who we are. Like I say, abundance multiplies us, and it, it, your nature as a, as a Christian. The only, if you're a Christian and you're not generous, you're either deceived or just don't know any better. Because your nature is generous. That's who you are on the inside already. And abundance multiplies that. So, it's absolutely amazing. Our new nature loves to give. But giving isn't actually, giving toward need, giving toward other people who have lack, is not actually the main reason why God wants to give us more than enough. And that might sound crazy, but bear with me. When Adam was the only human on earth, God gave him the entire earth. Everything you own at some point belonged to Adam. He was rich. 
He had more than he needed. There's no way he could use all of that. Why did God give Adam abundance when there's no need in the world for him to give to? Right, so again, I'm not saying that giving toward need is bad. It's fantastic. But the point of it, right, giving, uh, God giving us abundance was not because of the Satan. God was giving us abundance before anything bad even happened. And so it wasn't because of that. Another example here real quick. I'll, I'll tie these together in a second. In eternity, there's not going to be any lack. And yet God's going to give us more abundance than we can even imagine for all eternity. And so again, right now on this earth, one of the benefits of abundance is that we can help where there's lack. But that's not the main reason why God created it because we see it before the fall and we see it after the end of this world. God's heart is to give us abundance. See, part of why God wants us to have abundance is because he likes us. It's actually a form of poverty mindset to think that the only reason God wants to bless you is so you can give it to somebody else. Because that's basically saying, you don't like me, you only like them. I'm just a vessel, you hand it to me, hot potato. Bless me, Lord, I'll pass it on. Bless me, Lord, I'll pass it on. That's actually poverty mindset because you don't realize how much God likes you and wants to bless you. If you were the only human on earth, God would still want to bless you, even if there's no mission to accomplish. So part of, a, part of this is, that, is giving, but that's not the main reason. Another reason, so second reason why God likes to give us more than we need is so that we can invest in ourselves. Right, see, I used, to, well, let me give this example real quick. You know, if you have an abundance of money, it's easier to eat healthy. I don't know if any of you have ever gone to a grocery store and been like, I'm going to eat healthy today. And you look at the price tags and you're like, Never mind. <laughs> Sevenfold cost, right? It's like, okay, 30 bucks for, uh, you know, a sandwich, um, right? If you have an abundance of money, it's easier to have an abundance of health, right? If we have an abundance of time, we can use that to grow in wisdom, right? If we have an abundance of excellence, we can use that to grow in favor. See, abundance in some areas can actually be reinvested into our own lives and say, I'm going to use my time and not just sit around. I'm going to use this to grow in wisdom, I'm going to use my abundance of whatever, and I'm going to grow in revelation. I'm going to grow in this and that and the other. Um, right? Imagine that you're an amazing athlete, but you, you're totally broke, and nobody knows you. You have no favorite, right? You have poverty and everything else. Or imagine you're an amazing athlete, but you can afford world-class trainers, and you can afford world-class equipment, and you can afford to travel the world to compete and to learn and to train. Right? See, abundance can actually help you grow in even more abundance. Right? It's actually a biblical principle for the rich to get richer. Right? So, oh, you're being faithful with this. I want to give you even more. Right? And so, again, if we have abundance in an area, it can actually help us grow even more in that area. Right? Like I was saying, when, uh, when I was younger, I used to give away all my money. Like at the end of every month, I mean, I'd give everything away. Anything I had left over, I mean, I'd give off the top and give everything else. I'd spend as little as I could, and I'd give everything away. And finally, God had to stop me. And God said, Daniel, stop. You're good ground, too. He said, so into your own life. And... and uh, I'm not just saying this because it's campus days. It was actually when I was praying about coming to Karis. And I was like, how will I, you know, I was like, I was praying about tuition. And God said, stop giving every single thing away. I'm trying to provide for you, you, you to go to Karis. <laughs> and so I'd been giving away all my tuition money. And God's like, sow into yourself. Right? Again, so realizing that you're good ground also. See, again, it can be a poverty mindset to say the only reason God would bless me is for me to bless somebody else. It's no, God wants to bless you to expand you, to multiply you. Right? Again, imagine if you just give every single thing away. You never increase in your ability. You never, you, you limit, right? I mean, if I kept doing that, I'd still be making like minimum wage, giving away hundreds of dollars a month the rest of my life. You invest in yourself and suddenly you're multiplied and you can have a greater impact in the kingdom. So God wants us to be able to invest in ourselves to grow and expand in the things he's put inside of us. But like I said about giving, investing in yourself is, isn't the main reason God wants to give us more than enough either. Because we're not going to need to do that for eternity, right? We're not going to have lack around us or in us in eternity. So that can't be the main reason because giving and abundance aren't going to go away in eternity. So if we could go to slide number six, please. So the main reason for abundance is that it allows us to live life more fully. See, lack is not just hanging out. Lack is trying to kill you. It is not just a casual, low-maintenance house guest of like, I deal with lack. They get in my way every now and then. They eat stuff out of my fridge and it's annoying, but I deal with lack. I can put up with lack. It's like, no, lack is trying to kill you. 
Lack is trying to limit what God has put inside of you. Lack is trying to destroy your destiny and say, not that, only this. So lack is trying to draw you toward crisis lack, and crisis lack is trying to end your life, or at least areas of your life. But the opposite of that is that abundance is trying to bring you into more life. And I want to explain a little bit what that means. See, the point of lack is to kill you, but the point of abundance is to experience the fullness of life. So another way to look at this, if you could go to slide number seven, please. Right? If you're dead, you have no options. Right? So the more you go to the left in this chart, the fewer options you get. You go from lack, fewer options. Crisis lack, even fewer. Right? Lack, I don't like my options. Crisis lack, these are all terrible options. Kind of like voting. <laughs> and, and then crisis lack is zero option, right? Or after crisis lack, it's I'm, you're, when you're dead, right? People in hell have no options, right? You're done. But life is the opposite. The more you go from enough, enough, you have options. Yay. Abundance, you have more options. You go more and more and more, you have infinite options. Yay. And that's all part of life. See, it, let's look at a few different resources. Uh, there's no slide for this one, right? But if you lack money, you have fewer options. If you have an abundance of money, you have more options, right? It just makes perfect sense. One example with this. Imagine you want to go to the beach and you have lack. Okay, I can hitchhike. I can walk. I mean, it's pretty far from here. You can snowboard to the beach. <laughs> okay, if you have enough, you could drive there. But if you have abundance, the sky's the limit, right? You could... You could have a limo take you, and you could take a nap while going to the beach. You could have a helicopter take you, and it could take you 20 minutes. You could build a wave pool in your backyard, <laughs> right? See, the more abundance you have, the more options you have. See, because the point in all of this is that abundance allows you to no longer be limited by your resources. You're only limited by your imagination. That's what life is all about, is you're only limited by what God put inside your heart, not by what the world tells you you can and can't do. That is living abundant life, is I have more than enough, which allows me to choose based on my desires and my dreams, not based on my wallet, not based on my agenda, not based on my age, my whatever. See, abundance is all about living more life, living it more abundantly. Right? So lack of time, you have fewer options. Abundance of time, you have more options. Lack of health, you have fewer options. Abundance of, t of health, you have more options. Right? Lack of work ethic, you have fewer options. More work ethic, you have more options. On and on and on and on and on. If you, if you lack peace, you have fewer options. If you have an abundance of peace, more than you need. Oh, I can do that because I've got supernatural peace. Right? And so abundance is all about being able to live life more completely. You know, God is the ultimate creator, and he made you in his image. It is part of your eternal destiny now and after this world for you to be a creator. Because God made you in his image. It's part of who he wanted you to be as a creator, to be creative, to, to, to create, come up with things no one else has ever come up with. Another way of saying creating is overflowing. I see abundance allows us to create because, see, to create, you need options. Right? Imagine you're a dancer and you only know one move, like me, <laughs> right? Like, step to the side, step to, this is it. Okay, how many hours are we gonna be here, right? You can't be very creative in your dancing if you only know one move. Imagine you're a painter and you only have one paintbrush and one type of paint. You can do some things, but you're limited. See, creativity, you can be more creative the more options you have. And the more options you have require abundance, right? Abundance creates options. Options allow you to be creative to where now you and God dream together and say, I, would, I want to do this, let's do it, right? And maybe you don't see all the money, but you see the faith. You spoke it, I got a word from God, we, let's do it. Let's move in that direction, right? Abundance in different areas. See, to be fully alive, we need to be overflowing with joy, right? These are things God put inside of us, joy, re, all these resources that we're overflowing with to bless others and create with. Joy, healing, right? Oh, I, I have so much life in me, I, I don't even need it all. I can heal you. There's more life in me than I need, and so it can bless the people around me. There's more kindness in me than I need. I can bless the people around me, right? We're overflowing with things that we create, things that we build, things that we invent, with art, with gifts of the Spirit, with wisdom, all kinds of things. So even when there's no lack around us, overflowing will never get old. See, in the kingdom for all eternity, right now we can overflow and bless people who have need, 
but we're going to still bless each other when there's no need. We're going to be overflowing for all eternity because that's our nature. God's given us abundance so that we can be creative and overflow with life and health and peace and joy and, and ingenuity, all, all kinds of things. So, like I said, abundance multiplies how much you can overflow with who God created you to be. And you are worth multiplying. That's the thing is that God made us in his image and you are worth multiplying. And if we get a true revelation of that, it'll just break us free from thinking that poverty is anything holy or good. It, poverty cannot make us like Jesus because Jesus is full of abundance. And so again, it's all about breaking free from those lies and realizing I am who God said I am and he, he wants me to overflow the same way he overflows. So again, that's my final encouragement to you is that you are worth multiplying. Expand your definition of abundance because God wants you to be abundant in areas you had no idea about. So I pray that's been a blessing to you. Have an amazing rest of your day. Thank you.